Okay, so this is the 22nd lecture in this lecture series about creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, the last lecture was about the negative effects of colonialism on Indonesia, Indonesia's elite, Indonesia's leaders, and how they use Islam as a tool, as a weapon, they corrupt the religion. How then not only in Islam in Indonesia, but Islam is being corrupted everywhere by the power, those who are hungry for power and money. And so this lecture is about how the West understood colonialism and the arguments for it and the arguments against it, and how capitalism got corrupted, um, how it got developed and how it got corrupted and how there really were uh, wicked people behind it right from the beginning. There were also people calling it out right from the beginning. And so uh, we do have a society that's free enough so that these books exist and they always did exist. It's just that the bad guys won. Greed has been winning the war for um, power and wealth in the world and it must stop green energy will in the next i don't know less than a decade is going to have a leap forward so i'm presenting this on the assumption that there are going to be huge shifts and when green energy comes in as a philosopher you also have to have a paradigm shift or people will not really understand that this is about a lot more than how much you pay for your electricity. It's about how you think and how you live. Okay, so this is, these are quotes from Capra and Luis, Luigi, The System's View of Life, um, A Unifying Vision is the name of the book. Okay, he does talk a lot. He has a very good section on the history of global capitalism. With the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, critical reasoning, empiricism, and individualism became the dominant values, together with the secular and materialistic orientation that led to the production of worldly goods and luxuries and to the manipulative mentality of the industrial age. The new customs and activities resulted in the creation of new social and political institutions, and gave rise to a new academic pursuit, the theorizing about a set of specific economic activities, production, exchange, distribution, and money lending, which suddenly stood out in sharp relief and required not only description and explanation, but also rationalization. So now rationalization, human reasoning, is used to justify this very mechanistic view of culture, which is very barbarian. It really is an anti-culture culture because the emotions involved is the desire to calculate your own, your own economic prosperity. And with the assumption that everybody else will also be doing it and then everybody will be able to prosper. This was wrong. Um, but it worked, Newtonian mechanics, Newton used a mechanistic model to understand the universe, and that was just carried over into culture. The law of supply and demand fit perfectly with the new mathematics of Newton and Leibniz, the differential calculus. The notion became the basis of subsequent efforts to turn economics into an exact mathematical science. However, the problem was and is that the variables used in these mathematical models cannot be rigorously quantified, but are defined on the basis of assumptions that often make the models very unrealistic. Well, the, the irony of this, which is really horrible if you think about it. First of all, I want to point out that this was based on a view of the universe, just like when I started out these lectures, now we understand monism, right? There is an ultimate first principle and that leads to 
the view that we need uh, economic, it leads to a, the need for a sustainable, sustainable civilization. It leads to this organistic, organic view of reality, that there's a final cause. The universe is always expanding according to a certain underlying order, but the order only causes things to constantly become more and more sophisticated and complex and to lead toward higher and higher levels of complexity. Um, but that's not the way Newton understood it. Newton, you separate yourself. You don't really know what's out there. So you cut yourself off from monism or rejection of monism in favor of what your reason can do, it can create a whole body of scientific laws and put science, put the natural world, natural capacities, natural powers, fit it into this machine and then exploit those powers for human prosperity, for human wealth. And so the capitalist system was, so you go from the universe to human culture is a big system to the economic system is the machine that drives all the other systems. And this is really flawed and it has created, it has a barbarism. It's not culture at all. It's you put yourself first. You put this impersonal calculation of money before you put interactions with other people. It's causing us to be mentally ill. It's really toxic. But at the time, Adam Smith lived at a time when the Industrial Revolution has begun to change the face of Britain. When he wrote The Wealth of Nations, the transition from an ag agrarian handicraft economy to one dominated by steam power and by machines operated in large factories and mills was well underway. He enthusiastically advocated the social transformation of our, his time. So you have to realize it was a social transformation from an Aristotelian biological final cause oriented um, view of reality and also economic system to a mechanistic um, uh, machine-based view of a machine-based economy, a machine-based science, and then a machine-based pseudo-culture. But he was, Adam Smith, it was considered progress. It was all considered good. Smith believed in the labor theory of value, according to which the value of a product is derived only from the human labor required to produce it. But he also accepted the idea that prices would be determined, be determined in free markets by the balancing effects of supply and demand. You know, pe more people want it, um, the price will go up, and so the demand, you meet the demand, and then you get too much of something, that uh, the uh, supply to meet the demand, then you supply more and pretty soon there's less demand, so the price goes down, just that sort of stuff. He based his economic theory on the Newtonian notions of equilibrium, laws of motion, and scientific objectivity. This idealistic picture underlines the competitive model widely used by economists today. Its basic assumptions include perfect and free information for all participants in a market transaction, the belief that each buyer and seller in a market is small and has no influence on price, and the complete and instant mobility of displaced workers, natural resources, and machinery. All of these conditions are violated in the vast majority of today's markets, yet most economists continue to use them as the basis of their theories. This is so what we have now are a bunch of monopolies. And once a, a company just, you know, buys out another company and they can't compete, this is so far from the economic system we actually have. Adam Smith himself was worried about monopolies, but he just didn't 
think it was going to be that much of a problem. He thought it'd be a self-correcting system. He also knew that eventually the Earth's resources, you would have to control population. You would have to be careful about conservation. But he thought that was so far in the future, he wasn't going to worry about it. The, the idea of continual growth was adopted by succeeding generations of economists who paradoxically continued to use mechanistic equilibrium assumptions while at the same time postulating economic growth. You can't have an equilibrium when you're constantly exploiting, you know? It's not an equilibrium. It's, it's linear and it's self-destructive. Smith himself predicted economic progress would eventually come to an end when the wealth of nations had been pushed to the natural limits of soil and climate. But he thought that point was so far in the future, it was irrelevant to his theories. Well, here we are, right? Adam, thank you, Adam Smith. <laughs> okay, the goal of most national economies, even today, is to achieve unlimited growth of their GDP. Even though by now it should be abundantly clear, unlimited expansion on a finite planet can only lead to disaster. Economic growth can usually be maintained through artificial creation of needs, right, that's really desires, by means of advertising. People think they need something and they don't. The pollution and depletion of natural resources generated by this enormous waste of unnecessary goods is exacerbated by the waste of energy and materials in inefficient production processes. The continuing illusion of unlimited growth on a finite planet is the fundamental dilemma at the roots of all the major problems of our time. It's the result of a clash between linear reductionist thinking and the nonlinear patterns in our biosphere the ecological networks and cycles that constitute the web of life. This is so important. And Indonesia is a victim of this mindset, right? Um, because their resources are constantly being exploited without concern for, are you cutting down trees in a way that's renewable? Are you mining things? How are you renewing your resources? The complex financial instruments. So people have all these mathematical tools that they're using, but it's not, you know, this is a category mistake. It lays at the heart of the credit crisis. They were actually designed by mathematicians and physicists who used computer models to reconstitute the unreliable loans in ways that were supposed to eliminate most of the risks but their models turned out to be wrong because physicists and mathematicians are not experts in human behavior. Human behavior cannot be modeled mathematically. In their misguided efforts, they followed a long tradition of economists modeling how consumers behave as rational actors and self-interested individuals competing with each other to maximize their own gain. These narrow models in which pure greed is the main ingredient are mere caricatures of actual human behavior. So, for example, an older woman with a house would get a call from somebody at a bank who, whose job depends on them selling these loans that were that crashed eventually. So the seller doesn't look at the fine print. He just knows he's gonna get a promotion if he can sell these loans. He calls her up a hundred times. So finally she relents, she gets one of these loans and she ends up having to default. Or people care about their kids, right? So some parents uh, really want to be able to put a down payment on a house for their child because they really care about their child's well being. So they're, they, you know, they listen to these loan officers. How are they going to know as much as you need to know to be able to say no? Um, people will, you know, buy, have uh, 
a huge party for their baby's baptism. That's not economically, you know, sound. You say you're not calculating your own wealth. You're going to lose money. I mean, if you're a good calculator, you'd never get married. You'd never have kids. If you're poor in Thailand, you'd have girls and send them off into sex slavery. Tell them to send the money back. This is the model. You're a good economic calculator of your own self-interest. And it is really, people will say, no, 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 that's not true. If you just look at the model, that's a successful poor man in Thailand. He did what he had to do to be economically successful, pure greed. And that's called rational. That's why I went into philosophy because your understanding of rational, the difference between economic calculator modern scientific knowledge still based on exploiting nature and wisdom in the ancient traditions is so important. Okay, so Joseph Stieglitz. So here's another book, uh, Globalization and Its Discontents. So this lecture takes mostly or exclusively from those two books. Um, he was an, uh, the major organizer at the World Bank. I think he was president. He argues that, quote, globalization, if well-managed, could have benefited everyone, but it was typically not well-managed. The United States and other advanced countries wrote the rules of globalization, and they run the international organizations that govern it. The complaint of those in the developing world was that the advanced countries had written the rules and managed these international organizations in ways that disadvantaged them. And it was true. So uh, asking, by 2008, it was clear that globalization had led to the rapid transmission of the consequences of America's failures to manage its financial system to the rest of the world. Stieglitz has a long chapter on the East Asia crisis. One of his conclusions is that the International Monetary Fund policies made the situation worse. The nations that ignored their advice, the IMF advice, rejected a minimal government intervention in the market model and instead invested in education and other services to help the people were less devastated by the economic collapse. Once again, Ponchasilla principle number five is a good model to follow. Now, Indonesia certainly suffered. So did they suffer because they ignored their own Panchasila or did they suffer for other specific reasons about how much they invested or how much they followed the IMF? Well, the IMF now agrees it made serious mistakes in its fiscal policy advice. It has not admitted to the mistakes in its monetary policy, not even uh, nor has it even sought to explain why its models failed so miserably in practicing the course of events. It's not sought to develop an alternative intellectual framework. No one likes to admit a mistake, especially a mistake of this magnitude or with these consequences. The hubris pride of American and IMF policy advisors has had a terrible impact on Indonesia he cites Indonesia and is not being corrected. This crisis led to the social and political turmoil in Indonesia at the time. The thing I want to emphasize here, if you want, I know that students in Indonesia have to take a philosophy class. And this guy is saying it was a philosophy. It was a set of ideas underneath all this stuff that really drove it and perpetuated and still perpetuates it. These people have not um, sought to, to, to develop an alternative intellectual framework. That's a philosophy, a philosophy of culture, a philosophy of economics, and also a philosophy of education to perpetuate this worldview. And so that's why philosophy is important our views of what it means to be rational are really underlying all of this disaster and the destruction of life on earth 
the collapse of the economies, the horrible relation between the developed and developing countries, the horrible animosity between the rich and the poor within the developed countries, especially the US. So Marif understood that the motives driving the economic class, rather than building a civilization, the neocons, this is George W. Bush administration, have instead created an empire of barbarity and arrogance on the face of the earth. And that's what I'm arguing. That's what the systems view and the ancient wisdom and Aristotle specifically is the alternative. Marif understood that Bush appealed to religion. He also understood Bush used to talk about how he prayed and how religious, how God saved him from his drinking and all this stuff. He used religion in order to convince the American public of his honorable motives. When the Iraq war became less popular, he appointed Paul Wolfowitz. Paul Wolfowitz was a major player in invading Iraq. And when then that started to look bad, he appointed him to be president of the World Bank. Um, and he deliberately, right from the beginning, said, I'm going to restructure this place to make its policies to favor the US. So Stieglitz, that was not what Stieglitz wanted, but but by the time um, Bush came along and, and somehow the US gets to appoint the head of the World Bank, like who said that? How come the US gets to control all this? He deliberately said he's gonna set it all up to favor the US as he has done throughout his career. That was why he, he was part of the group that invaded Iraq was for the U.S. to have cheap oil. That, you know, uh, this was one reason for the collapse was Wolfowitz corruption. Just flat out corruption, he just said it, because they're not apologizing for this intellectual model. Centuries ago, Max Weber understood that this mechanistic model of society and economics would destroy culture. People knew this way back. Weber was not only one of the first observers of the parallels between the mechanization of industry and bureaucratic forms of organization, but also the first to offer a comprehensive definition of bureaucracy as a form of organization emphasizing precision, clarity, regularity, reliability, and efficiency. He was concerned about the psychological and social effects of the proliferation of bureaucracy, the mechanization of human life, the erosion of the human spirit, and the undermining of democracy. And so it's terribly unfortunate and, and shockingly wrong that those wisdom traditions get associated with anti-democracy and these mechanistic models get associated with freedom, equality, and democracy. Because actually in terms of culture, the ancient view of the obligation of the educated to lift up and create a middle class is much more likely, much more oriented toward what we would call democracy, a strong and stable middle class. Whereas the mechanistic view is, is just falls into this uh, barbaric and non-democratic uh, model of of um, society. So even if it starts out in a democracy, if you let money stick to money, you will end up with the rule of the rich, which is what Aristotle said. The largely unconscious embrace of the mechanistic approach to management has now been one of the main obstacles to organizational change. And this again is from the Capra and Luigi book. And this is true and it's important and it's why philosophy and the history of ideas, Western thought, it's important to study it because it's the source of the problems and the obstacles. As we move further into the 21st century, transcending the mechanistic view of organizations will be as critical for the survival of human civilization as transcending the mechanistic conceptions of health, the economy, or biotechnology. All these issues are linked ultimately to the profound scientific, social, and cultural transformation that is now underway with the emergence of the new systemic conception of life. So I've already, I have published extensively on 
the connection between Ar Aristotle systems thinking and Panchasila. And I, this is, you know, this is so important. So I hope that this, this lecture especially will communicate why philosophy is important, why the concept of rationality is important, and why I taught Western thought a two semester class. And by the end of that class, students could understand why we're destroying life on earth. There was a history behind it. There was an intellectual history behind it. And we still keep clinging to these very, very false and destructive ideas. We can't let them go. Or the people who came to power with those ideas are not going to give them up. And so the rest of us has, have to call it out. It's really serious stuff. Um, so, and developing countries have suffered so much from this. I just, it's so important that people have a set of ideas. People who do this, to do, do this colonizing, justify it. They justify it through this notion of rationality. Oh dear. Anyway, so 